My journey as an adoptee, and thus the story of me finding my birth family, starts with this photo. This is the only photo I had of my birth mother for nearly two decades. Growing up, this photo made me feel unavoidable and unfathomable grief. It was this overwhelming and profound sense of inexplicable loss, and I couldn't understand why. You see, I was a newborn when I was adopted, so these feelings of separation and loss I was feeling, it didn't make sense to me. But after going through therapy for a lot of years, thank you, Mom and Dad, for paying for that, <laughs> but also talking with other adoptees, I learned that these feelings I was feeling were called trauma responses to my experience with adoption. I learned that these trauma responses may come in waves or feelings of grief and loss and separation, but also anger and abandonment, curiosity, confusion, and more. These trauma responses may percolate into work and professional life, relationships both intimate as well as with family and friends, and mental and physical health and well-being. Studies have shown that adoptees are more likely than non-adopted individuals to experience psychological distress, be diagnosed with some form of mental illness, struggle with substance abuse, and in a staggering statistic, I learned that adoptees are four times more likely than non-adopted individuals to attempt suicide at least once in their lifetime. That's a shocking statistic to me. I, like so many adoptees, had unanswered questions about my home country, my culture, my language, my identity, and my lost heritage. And these deep-rooted emotions I was feeling only magnified this curiosity within me. But I am not alone in wanting answers. Many adoptees want answers. In a study of American adolescents, the Search Institute identified that 72% of adoptees wanted to know why they were adopted. 65% wanted to meet their biological parents. And 94% wanted to know which biological parent they looked the most alike. In 2018, I was blessed enough that my parents were so supportive of me that we wanted to go to Vietnam. And so we braved the intense heat and humidity of Vietnam in the summertime. And let me tell you, it is hot. And we walked through these beautiful temples and landscapes that were so intricate in design, vibrant in color, and rich in history. We first landed in Hanoi, which is in the north of the country of Vietnam, and we descended south, stopping in cities along the way and spending a couple of days in each one. I ate so much food, I drank so much Vietnamese coffee, but I also basked in this oddly comfortable glow of the Vietnamese sun that just felt like I was hugging an old friend. Needless to say, Vietnam was a comfortable space for me. It just felt like I was catching up on lost time. Vietnam was also an interesting experience for me for two reasons. The first was that for the first time in my life, I was no longer a minority. I was no longer the only Asian person in the room. I was no longer the only Vietnamese person in the room. But I was surrounded by people who looked like me, and that was exciting and refreshing. The second reason was that I had this very real and funny experience of thinking that every person I passed on the street was a relative. I figured that maybe a 50 or 60-year-old woman might recognize me as her daughter, and we would have one of those epic movie moments of like slow motion running and hugging. So I spent a lot of time feeling very hopeful, time being discouraged, and a time searching for a lot of faces for recognition. I'm sure they thought I was a bit creepy. When we first landed in Hanoi, our wonderful translator, Bin, had told us about this private investigation agency whose services, I learned, had a high success rate of connecting people once disconnected by circumstance. I was so nervous at the thought of hiring somebody to help me find my birth family because I wasn't ready for potentially bad news. You see, for the longest time, my parents used to send my birth mother or the address on my birth certificate photos and memories and letters of me growing up so she could know that I was safe and that I was doing okay. They also sent her return postage so that she could send something back so that we knew that she was getting these photos and not just some random family somewhere. But we never got anything in return, so we stopped sending them. 
And I, in my mind, there existed three alternatives for this. The first was that she could have moved away. She could have given us the wrong address. Or she could have passed away. And I wasn't ready for that potentially bad news. I wasn't ready to learn how to cope with that kind of devastation. So I didn't know if I should hire them or we should hire them. But we did anyway, because like, when else are you in Vietnam? When else am I that close to my birth family? And we waited. Two weeks later, we were in Ho Chi Minh City, or the city of my birth. It's also known as Saigon. And it was late at night, and my parents and I were sitting in our hotel room, kind of packing up because we were supposed to be leaving within the next two days. And we get this email on my dad's computer, and my parents rush over to his laptop, ready and eager to open it to see the contents of what's inside. And the hotel room filled with this hopeful and dense silence that my mother ultimately broke when she exclaimed, they found them. They found your birth family. They did, in fact, find my birth family. I learned that my birth mother, Mai, had five other children, including me. She was also living with her husband, which was surprising to me because he was unnamed on my birth certificate. He was unidentified, so I didn't know who he was. But I also learned that I had siblings, which was really surprising and beautiful and shocking to me. The eldest was a boy. He was married and living elsewhere at the time. And then there was a girl. She was adopted to France in the late 80s. And then Mai had another boy. He was only a couple years older than me, and he sold lottery tickets on the street. Unfortunately, a year after we met my birth family, he was taken into enslavement, and we haven't heard from him since. And then there was me, adopted to the United States in the early 2000s, and causing a lot of trouble ever since. And then, I had a little sister. I didn't know I had this little sister, so you can imagine my shock when there's a little girl that looks exactly like me. So we canceled all of our plans the next day. My parents and I are in this car driving up this busy and bustling street in Ho Chi Minh City, and we see her. The woman in the photo I had grown up staring at all my life, standing on this street, on this busy street corner with motorcycles and mopeds passing by, and she was pacing anxiously waiting for our arrival. When we get out of the car, she hugs my mother first and recognizes her immediately. And they have one of those epic movie moments of slow motion running and hugging. It was beautiful. And then she hugs my father and then me. And she grabs my hand and we walk through this narrow street among these tall houses. When we get to her house, my birth mother's house, we're sitting on these little stools. And I don't know if you can picture this, but my dad is like 6'2", and he was crouched down on this like little baby doll stool, and it was really funny. But I turn around and I notice that we have gathered quite a crowd. There's people from the neighborhood that gathered just trying to gl get a glimpse of what was going on, and they, some were eating noodles, others were FaceTiming people elsewhere in the city, and some were trying to talk to my parents and I, but because we didn't share a language, I had little to no idea what they were saying. And then my birth mother comes down these stairs with a folder. Do you remember the photos we used to send her when I was growing up? She had them. The photos, the memories, the letters. She had kept them, but she not only kept them, she traveled with them. And clearly, she kept them very close to her heart. We take my birth family out to lunch, and we had this gorgeous feast of food, and I don't think I could tell you what I ate that day. But I was taking mental photos of the moment that I had dreamed of all of my life. You see, I was sitting next to my birth mother and my adopted mother. I was sitting next to my birth father and my adopted father, and I was sitting next to a little sister I didn't even know that I had. We get permission, and we take my little sister back to our hotel room for the evening. We walked through the streets together. We found an Italian restaurant, and I think she had a cheeseburger for the first time. 
And then we take her shopping, and because we didn't share a language, I had no idea what I could buy for her, so we played hide-and-seek in the clothing racks instead. But the most beautiful part was is that she had this very strange and wonderful protective instinct over me, and she held my hand to make sure I didn't get hit by a motorcycle on the highway. When we take her back the next day, and I turn around as we're departing the street, I see my birth family waving, smiling, and hugging as we're driving away. I was just catching up on lost time. So you may wonder, why don't more adoptees find their birth family, right? Like, there's 23andMe and Ancestry.com, so why don't more adoptees do the search? Unfortunately, I don't just have one answer, and frankly, I don't think there is one. Every adoptee has a different, unique experience in narrative and story, every rhyme and reason as to why. So no, I can't give you one answer. But what I can give you is perhaps guidance toward understanding just my take and perspective on the situation. So many times in my life, and in many adoptees' lives, we're told that we're lucky, that we're chosen, you were handpicked, you should be so grateful, you were given a better life. I once had a teacher tell me that, I was in trouble, of course, but this teacher told me that I should be so grateful that I'm in this country, that my parents were kind enough to adopt me. I call this the lucky narrative. And what this lucky narrative does is that it so often assumes the best of those that adopted us, often calling them saviors, while subconsciously implying that our ethnic cultures are lesser than. And in doing so, it denies access to the cultures we lost, our heritage, and our roots. If we only focus on what adoptees gain, while not also addressing what adoptees lost, it oftentimes denies the opportunity to come to terms with the trauma that is associated, or often associated with that loss. Mindy Stern, a fellow adoptee, says this, talking about adoption with idealized language creates an unrealistic paradigm, one where what we lost isn't just diminished, it's denied. You see, this is an unusual position to be in, because when we confine adoptees in this role of exclusively presenting gratitude or this luckiness, we oftentimes deny this opportunity of experiencing, identifying, and processing through this wide spectrum of other emotions that often come along with adoption. And in doing so, we confine them to a single narrative. Many people, family members, and friends look toward adoptees for the reassurance that we're happy, content, grateful, and well acclimated. But what is missing, and what so often we forget, is this opportunity to experience these things, these feelings of love and gratefulness, and, and, and all of these other beautiful feelings, and, and struggling through and grappling with this trauma and sense of loss and displacement. This is not to say that all adoptions cannot contain happiness and love. But when the conversation only includes happiness and love, the other side of adoption, the side where we look at adoption through the lens of an adoptee, is not often talked about enough. Bringing adoptee voices to the conversation is not talked about enough. And I argue that you can't really have adoption without an adoptee, right? So I feel like we should start consider bringing adoptee voices to the part of adoption and the conversation of adoption. So you may ask, how do I amplify adoptee voices? Well, so many adoptees lately are coming forward with their experiences, stories, and narratives that it's getting easier to find them. So. I encourage you to do what you're doing now, and hey, you all are doing a great job. You're listening. Amazing, right? A skill that we so often forget that we have. Because a lot of times we like to jump in with a conversation about like your ex-girlfriend's dog that was adopted, right? But sometimes that's probably not the best way to talk about adoption with an adoptee. So I encourage you to start amplifying adoptee voices in your life. When you're reading about adoption, think about the adoptee. And I promise you that as you do this, 
Adoptee voices are going to become more beautiful, broad, and nuanced, and vibrant, more so than you can ever imagine. So thank you for amplifying my voice today, and thank you for coming to my TEDx Hope College talk. <laughs>